Hi everybody! Today the book that I'm going to be focusing on is Essentialism by Greg McEwen. And one of the quotes that I think really sums up this book for me and stands out is, I can do anything but not everything. I think that this quote is really counter popular culture because we do have this hustle culture where you go onto Instagram and you see all of the ways that people are living magnificent lives and you can do any of that but you can't do it all. So just having that in the forefront of your mind and let that be something that guides your thinking when it comes to this book. The author is a public speaker as well as a business and leadership strategist and I feel the need to mention that because he lives and breathes these tactics. It's not just a book he wrote and then left. It was super successful on the New York Times and Wall Street Journal bestseller. It's not like he just did that and sold it and moved on. He still uses these tactics. He lives by them and he continues to practice and preach them. And he's the CEO of McEwen Incorporated. His clients include Adobe, Apple, Google, Facebook, Pixar, and Yahoo, which are all extremely popular and powerful brands that he has worked with that have chosen him to help improve their processes. And just a little caveat about this book, it is quite special to me because it's really the starting point of me being interested in self-development books and not just interested in them, but interested in reading them and sharing those ideas again. So this was all the way back in lockdown. My mom was working and somebody above her had mentioned this book and how powerful it was, but she didn't necessarily have the time to read it. So I thought I had the time, nothing much to do, <laughs> being on lockdown and everything. So I will read it and then transfer these ideas back to her because I love self-development, always have, and I like talking. <laughs> so I did just that and I relayed the ideas to her and she really enjoyed it. And so I even did it for a few of the people that worked under her. And it got me on to this real interesting passion for reading self-development books and sharing those ideas for people who may not have the time to sit down and read a whole book, but who still deserve to listen to these excellent ideas and grow from them. And so I actually worked for a company, an amazing company, where I could do just that. I had one hour Zoom sessions. Each hour would focus on a specific book. And we'd spend that hour where I would prepare a PowerPoint and I would give the ideas of the book much like I do in these videos. And then there would be some talking points and people would join in and it would become something that wasn't just me talking, but more of a discussion. And I absolutely love that. Unfortunately, that company did close closed down but it was such an such an excellent way to connect with people so on that note I would be so happy to start my own zoom sessions and if anybody is interested in that joining a zoom session where for an hour I talk about a book but definitely involve you so that you can share your experiences or what you think if that sounds appealing to you in any sense of the word please do just leave a comment down below and or reach out to me on my Instagram, whatever the case may be, whatever is easier for you. And hopefully we could set something up because I think it would be amazing to connect with people like that over something so positive such as a self-development book. So the author opens up with this statement that a lot of people make a millimeter of progress in a million directions. So if your energy is in the middle and there are little arrows all around your energy that shows you your progress, when you are focusing on so many different projects, your effort goes in all those directions. And although you've got a lot going on, the progress in all of those directions are not super memorable. It's not something that people will stop and look at and say, wow, that's excellent progress. So from that, 
you want to change all those arrows into one arrow. So all your effort and attention is in one direction so that your energy is not being split up on 101 different planes, but rather on one single one where you can make excellent progress that is noticeable and people will step back and look and say, wow that person is doing well and you might look at people who are successful in various areas of their lives and think how do they do it how do they have it all but that's not always the case you often find that they are really prioritizing that one thing that they are successful at and that's why it's standing out for you so my biggest takeaways from this book is actually taking a moment to stop and ask yourself, what do you spend your time doing? And how does that add or take away from your goals? And maybe you're a person who loves to do a lot of different things and many things inspire you. But are you expending energy in so many directions without actually making progress on one thing? The author says it's not about doing less for the sake of less, but rather doing less and doing it better. Stop rushing through a to-do list and actually stop and consider what's on that to-do list. So instead of ticking off so, so, so many things, consider that to-do list. Could you make more progress in one area if you dedicated more time to it instead of trying to accomplish so many things in just one day or one week. And at the end of the day, this is all about appreciating your time because time is precious. It's a valuable commodity. So you want to use it in a way that's clever, that's smart, instead of feeling so exhausted at the end of the day because you've done so many different things and you actually don't feel like you have accomplished too much. With that, is a plan of action and I think with this the biggest thing that comes to mind when I think of this plan of action is clarity because motivation and cooperation deteriorates when there's a lack of purpose so when you have goals or things that you are working towards they need to be concrete they need to be something that's not up there like i want to be famous that's not very concrete i know that's a random example and i suppose for the sake of making it super clear a way that you could make that more concrete is i want to star in a netflix tv show you want to make it meaningful meaningful to you if it's meaningful to be in a Netflix TV show about motivation because you inspire others, you're ticking that box. But if it's just to please the people around you, that may not necessarily be meaningful and you may not stick to those actions towards those goals. And it needs to be measurable. If you give yourself an unending time limit to achieve this thing, you're never going to feel too motivated to complete it. So make sure that you take in your personal goals, your values, and your aspirations. And to help you with this, the author has a bit of a diagram. So imagine you have three circles. In one circle, you ask yourself, what inspires you? In another circle, you ask yourself, what are you talented at? And in the third circle, you look at what meets a significant need in the world. And these circles will hopefully start to intersect in, as a Venn diagram would. And in the middle of those three would be your purpose, something that you're going to work toward, something that inspires you, but at the same time you are talented at, but also is a way to help people. So it serves a purpose. It's not just about you. And that doesn't mean that we all need to quit our jobs and become firefighters or doctors or things that are outwardly heroic. But even being a teacher, that's a way to help. If it inspires you to teach, if you're talented at explaining things, by teaching something, whatever it is, it could be math, whatever it is, it's helping somebody understand a concept. So there is a lot of purpose in that. And you can be creative with it. What things inspire you and what things are you talented at and how could those things actually help people? you've taken a bit of time to understand or wrap your head around a goal of yours that is very important to you or serves a purpose 
Now you need a more detailed plan of action by asking yourself, am I investing my time in the right activities? Am I investing my time in this goal? What I do, my actions, do they contribute to this goal? Do they take away from it? Or do they absolutely add anything to your life? So to do this, you want to look at the closet analogy. And so the author kind of likens this to spring cleaning when your closet is super messy and you haven't taken the time to donate some clothes that you don't wear you go through that spring cleaning, you donate clothes or you throw out clothes and in the end you've got the things that you really need and use. You're going to do this again with your to-do list or your day-to-day -day routine. You're going to look at all the things that you do in a day, be it a work day or a relaxed day, it really depends on you and your goals. And you're going to ask yourself, do I love this? Does it make me feel great? Or will this activity or effort make the highest contribution towards my goal? And I know that you don't always love the things that might contrib contribute to your goal. But if it's not contributing to your goal and you don't love it and it doesn't make you feel great, why are you doing it? If it does contribute to your goal but you don't love it and it might not make you feel great, at least it's doing that. If it does make you feel great, then at least that's something that can help you prioritize certain activities. But if an activity doesn't take any of those boxes, really consider why it's on your to-do list, so to say. And I know it's easier said than done, but be ruthless and eliminate what doesn't serve you and your goals. And make this a regular routine. Don't think that once you have a certain to-do list after doing this, that you never have to check it again. Life changes, we change, our goals change. You might reach a goal and have a new goal. So come back to it and view it as spring cleaning, looking at your schedule and asking yourself truthfully and honestly, does this add to or take away from a goal or purpose that I'm working toward? And so I did do this myself. I always like to say that I wouldn't suggest something that I haven't tried and implemented in my whole own life. So I did do it. I got a piece of paper from 5 a.m. to 8 p.m., wrote down all the things that I did hour to hour, and be honest here, I think that was something that I found really useful, was being honest, not judging myself before I'd even written the thing down. And I wrote it and I noticed that at one point I spent like an hour scrolling on my phone before cooking and eating dinner. And I asked myself, does that make me feel great? No. Do I love it? No. And does it make the highest contribution to a goal that I have? No. So I decided that I could switch that to going for a walk or doing yoga because at the end of the day, I want to spend my time doing something that I either love, makes me feel good or makes the highest contribution to the goal that I'm working on. And if you don't take this time to seriously stop and look at what you spend your time doing, you may unconsciously waste time or do things that you actually don't like. And I think that is a great segue to the next section of this book, which is Live by Design and Not Default by Learning to Say No. I think one of the biggest pitfalls that we get into is spending time doing things that we actually don't want to do because we overcommitted, because we said, yes, we'll help, we'll do that, because it feels good to help people in that way, but we actually don't want to spend time doing that. We don't love it. It doesn't make us feel good, and it doesn't add to our purpose or overarching goal. So the author says, stop trying to do it all. Don't be the person that always says yes. And ask yourself, how often do you say yes simply because, without even thinking, if somebody asks you to do something, you just say yes. That's problematic because you, go to, you become the go-to person. People learn that when they ask you things, you say yes, so they'll go to you again and they realize that it's easy to do that. And you might find that in certain areas you find it very easy to say no. 
and you might find that in other areas such as your personal life you find it very difficult to say no but get into the habit of taking some time before you immediately say yes because when you say no people aren't going to hate you and actually they will respect your honesty and don't live by other people's agendas don't live by other people's goals because at the end of the day you're helping them with something to further their goal you're living according to what their schedule is saying instead of yours and people are effective because they say no Be saying a clear no and being honest about that is more respectable than saying yes and saying oh maybe i'll show up but i'll show up late and i won't do a great job rather say no and people can really back what you say and especially when this comes to people who are close to you, separate the decision from the relationship. You're not saying no to a family member. You're saying no to the two hours you might spend at a barbecue that you don't really want to go to. And focus on the trade-off. I refer you back to that quote we said in the beginning. It's not about doing less for the sake of less, but doing less but better. You're saying no to this one activity because you will spend more time contributing to something else. Something that I definitely think is worth mentioning and that the author is passionate about too is your mental health. And one of the biggest proponents of this is sleep and i remind you that the author has followed some of the most successful people in the world one of which believed that oh, i'll sleep when i'm dead the author watched somebody who said this and he realized that you need to choose to backscale or you will be forced to this person who said oh i'll sleep when i'll when i'm dead i don't need to sleep eventually they had a complete breakdown because we need sleep to power our brains that's how simple it is if you're familiar with macbeth that's not too far from the truth when he stopped sleeping he lost his sanity and that will most definitely happen to you if you don't prioritize your sleep and if you choose to deprioritize your sleep eventually you will have to and that might take longer than if you just did it bit by bit if you prioritized it daily the author says that being able to escape is also important because without great solitude no serious work is possible and that's by picasso so essentially being able to escape means being able to leave your work being able to do something alone to sit with yourself it doesn't have to be a long period of time especially if you are an extrovert or somebody who feels more energized by being surrounded by people but go for a drive go for a walk whatever the case may be escape and give some time for yourself and you and then play embrace the wisdom of your inner child by doing something not because it's productive but because you just enjoy it and this might seem like wasting time but being able to play being able to do something that's quote unquote fun helps you be creative and it helps you to solve problems but also increases your well-being because what is the point of doing well if you're not happy and especially if play can involve something with the people around you it's also going to increase and foster good relationships importantly the author also says to celebrate your progress we've got this big overarching goal that we've realized in the beginning of this talk so celebrate the little steps along the way because you wouldn't get to the end points or is there really an end point that's a talk for another day but you wouldn't get to the end without those little steps especially the ones in the beginning so celebrate the tiny milestones and be kind to yourself along the way I want to share some essential tips that might not fall under a specific theme, but that I thought were worthy enough to mention. Number one, a buffer, preparing for the unexpected. When you have something coming up, be it a presentation, a meeting, prepare for it. Prepare for something bad to happen and have a backup for whatever could happen. And he uses an example of hiking to Mount Everest. There was 
two teams, the one team didn't have any backups and they prepared as if everything would go smoothly and they did not make it. Whereas another team prepared for everything that could go wrong along the way and they made it to the top. So maybe that makes it clearer for you, but in your mind, if there's something important to you that's coming up, make sure that you've got plan Bs and a few of them. Next one is create your workspace. If you work in the same area that you relax, your brain will be confused about whether it's time to relax or whether it's time to work. And I understand that we have different environments, so it might be difficult for you to separate your workspace from your relaxing space in a way that's actually physical. But in this sense, make a little routine at the end of the day so that your brain knows it's time to switch off. When you close your laptop, leave it closed. Maybe go for a walk, start cooking, bake something, whatever it is, a little routine that tells your brain that the day is over because your brain will fall for it, I promise you, and it will become a habit. And then boundaries. Be very serious about creating boundaries. And this links very well with the ideas we were talking about, about learning to say no. When people ask you of things or ask you for help or you feel like you need to help even if they didn't ask, don't rob people of their problems. When you've had a difficult situation and you were forced to work on it by yourself, and figure it out. You probably learned a lot and you probably felt a lot more equipped to deal with another situation to come. So if you continue to help people and don't let them solve their problems on their own, you may be enabling them and taking away some confidence for them to deal with it and learn from it and become more solid in themselves to deal with things the next time it arises. Also, don't water somebody else's grass. And I'm not trying to say that you should never help people, but don't, watering grass is something that's very habitual. It's something that, you know, this is my grass, I'm going to water it and I need to do this continually. Water your own grass. Focus on your own goals. It's okay to help every now and then, but don't let it be so habitual that their grass becomes your grass. Also, there's so much genius and routine. I will stand by this until the end of days. Create a routine, stick by it. Eventually, your brain will just move through it slowly and you don't have to even think about what you should do next because you know what's coming. Keep a journal. It doesn't have to be strictly this or strictly that, but you can think of it as backing up your hard drive. You can look back on it and think, oh, that happened on that day. That made me feel good. That didn't make me feel good. Keeping a journal is a way of reliving things. It's a way of understanding what works well for you and what doesn't. And be present. All about this, all about essentialism is about learning to focus on the things that matter and prioritizing them. Because if you don't focus on work, at work, then you're going to be focusing on work when you're at home and you're not going to be focusing on your family or your loved ones. Then when you're back at work, then you may be focusing on what you missed out when you were with your loved ones. So it becomes a vicious cycle and this prioritizing things, focusing on certain things, having a good routine, learning to say no ultimately helps you stay more present. Essentially, would you ever say, I wish I'd been less true to myself and done all the non-essential things others expected of me? Hopefully, the answer to that is no. If one's life is simple, contentment has to come. Simplicity is extremely important for happiness. And the author says, what is essential? Eliminate everything else. Again, if you would like to reflect on some of these things, you could ask yourself or write down in your journal if you have one. Why is it important to live essentially? How can you live more essentially? What are important things in your life and what things aren't? And what does the word essential mean to you? Thank you so much for watching and sharing your time with me. Again, leave any possible comments or questions you might have or any recommendations for a book that you would like me to review.